This is the video lecture for microbiology for Thursday, January 23rd, 2020. And uh, where we're picking up is in chapter seven, uh, where we've talked specifically about microbial nutrition and growth and nutritional needs. And here we're talking about uh, different types of culture. And so the first type of culture is called a batch culture. A batch culture is just typically what we grow. We add a batch of nutrients um, in growth media, usually in a culture tube, and that batch of nutrients can be solid, liquid, or semi-solid. And um, once we've got the nutrition in the tube, then we inoculate the tube and we allow all phases of growth um, lag phase, exponential phase, stationary phase, and death phase, all within the same culture. Um, that's what we typically use, and it allows for rather rapid growth, and it's rather convenient. Uh, a different type of culture is what's called a chemostat, and a chemostat has a continuous feed of nutrition. So during the entire lifetime of the culture, there's always a feed line that is dripping in or flowing in nutrition in liquid media. And on the other side of the vessel, you're siphoning off cells. And by doing that, then you keep the cells directly in the exponential growth phase and you can maximize growth during all times of culture. Chemostat looks something like this, where we've got um, a liquid vessel Okay, we've got a, a liquid culture in a vessel. This vessel is sterile, and we pump in medium, uh, fresh nutrients, and then we pump out cells and effluent liquid to an effluent reservoir, and then we collect the cells and we collect our product. Uh, if this is done correctly, then the cells will stay in the exponential phase, and you'll experience exponential growth over long periods of time. These are much more difficult to maintain, uh, especially maintaining sterility, because you've got air coming in um, to provide oxygen, other nutritional requirements. You've got medium coming in. Both these lines have to be sterile and sterilized in place. Same with the air out in the effluent reservoir. So there's much more to sterilizing uh, this entire vessel and it, um, you have to have sterile filters in line to make sure that the air and media coming in are completely sterile. So it becomes more difficult. Uh, contamination is much easier, uh, but it does allow you to keep the cells in exponential growth phase and it maximizes the productivity. Here are some batch cultures uh, that are being grown for algae. Uh, the algae hasn't grown very much at this particular point in time because the vessels aren't green, but you can see that they're supplying exogenous light, so uh, photosynthesis can occur. Um, here are some chemostats, and you notice there's a lot of lines going in and out of the chemostats, um, and pumps uh, over to the side here of the chemostats that can pump in nutrients and pump out effluent at the same time. And then finally, um, in this chapter, we'll talk about measurement of cell growth. So to determine cell growth, one of the easiest things that you can do is just to count the individual cells. But there are lots and lots of cells, so this can be a really tedious task. So Instead, if we're just looking very quickly to see if the cell culture grew, then we can look at turbidity. Now, turbidity can correlate directly with population size, and we can use what's called a spectrophotometer. Uh, this is just an instrument that measures light transmission through a culture tube of cells. And if there aren't a whole lot of cells, there's not a whole lot to block the light, so you have a high transmission of light. If there are a lot of cells and you have a lot of cloudiness, then this impedes the transmission of light and you have a high cell count. So you can correlate the number of cells directly to turbidity or the transmission of light in a spectrophotometer. Uh, direct counting methods, you can do this on a microscope slide. 
Uh, you can also do this just by plating out culture and allowing uh, the culture to grow in petri dishes and counting colonies. And then you can use what's called a culture counter, which is a device that automatically counts cells. So if you want to count on a microscope slide, you're not going to count all of the cells on an individual slide. So you use a gridded microscope and you count the cells in one of these grids. You um, take a confluent layer of cells, or I'm, I'm sorry, not confluent, but you just take a layer of cells and you spread them across evenly. So you just have a small number and a small consistent number of cells in each one of these grids. Then you take the number of cells per small grid and you multiply them by the number of grids on the microscope slide, and that gives you a rough estimate of how many uh, bacteria you have on your entire slide. A culture counter is a device where you add the cells directly to a very, very small orifice, and the orifice here is small enough that only one cell can pass through at a time. And then you have an electronic device that looks at uh, the difference in light intensity. You should have been up a light here, and every time a cell goes by, that causes the light to be uh, shielded. And every time the light's shielded, then that will automatically count one cell. And so you can count numerous um, uh, cells in large samples in this particular fashion. Uh, usually the samples are still diluted uh, because you're not talking about counting billions of cells, you're talking about counting thousands of cells. And also this can't differentiate between live and dead cells. If you use what's called a flow cytometer, uh, this uses a specific dye um, that will only dye live cells and it counts the colored cells that are, uh, that are living and so you can overcome this. And so flow cytometers can di differentiate between live and dead cells. Okay, so let's say you have three bacteria uh, per uh, square on a thousand grid slide. So to determine how many bacteria you have in the sample, you just take the three bacteria per square and you multiply them by a thousand squares, and that means that you have 3,000 bacteria in the sample. What's binary fission? Binary fission is the process by which single cells, single prokaryotic cells divide. Um, it's helpful to review the slide on binary fission that shows that first the chromosome duplicates and then attaches to a special site in the plasma membrane and the cells elongate, forming two cells and a septum before they completely divide. You should also know the phases of cell growth, the lag phase, the exponential phase, and stationary phase and death phase. The lag phase is where cells are just assimilating the enzymes in order to metabolize nutrients. And so because they're assimilating the enzymes, they don't grow as fast as the exponential phase. But then once the cell growth is unlimited, they go into exponential phase. During stationary phase, cell growth and cell death rates are equal. And during the death phase, cell death overtakes cell growth. And then finally, I've got a doubling time calculation for you to start or to, for you to complete. Uh, if you have a doubling time of one hour and you start with one bacterium, how many bacteria you have in 24 hours, that would just be 2 to the 24th power uh, and use the doubling time equation to practice this particular problem. And that concludes Chapter 7. So at this point, we'll go on to Chapter 11. Chapter 11 is entitled Physical and Chemical Control of Microbes. And our objectives here are to understand the different physical and chemical techniques to destroy, remove, and reduce microbes, to reduce contamination, uh, mostly on inanimate objects. We'll understand the different types of microbial control agents, uh, the different chemicals that are used, uh, and other entities such as heat or steam sterilization. And then we'll understand how they, what's their mode of operation or mode of action, what are they, 
uh, destroying within cells in order to kill the cells. So just some definitions for you. If we destroy all microbial life, we call that sterilization. If we destroy most microbial life, but we don't completely sterilize uh, the entity, and this is mostly on inanimate surfaces, we call that disinfection. Uh, the growth of microbes on in blood and other tissues is called sepsis. And then the opposite of sepsis would be antisepsis. And this is the same as disinfection, but antisepsis is usually reserved for uh, surfaces on living organisms, say like human skin. And then decontamination, uh, this is not using chemicals, uh, but more mechanical removal of most microbes from an inanimate um, or um, light living object. So if something's being decontaminated, then the microbes are being um, mechanically removed, but they're not being chemically scrubbed. So here's a yummy um, abdominal wall infection. Uh, and you can see this is a type of sepsis, and you can see all the odd colors because of bacterial and fungal growth within the infection. Um, here's another type of infection called gas gangrene. This is a blood infection that is attacking the extremities where circulation is, uh, is poorer. Um, in terms of resistance of microbial control, it's important to know what is high res highly resistant to microbial control and what is uh, fairly low resistant or fairly easy to kill. So the highest resistance would be prions. Prions are the most difficult thing entity to kill, infectious entity to kill when you're using um, disinfection. Next would be bacterial endospores, but prions are the most difficult to kill. Moderate resistance, this would be the middle range, would be protozoan cysts. Um, uh, protozoan cysts are dormant forms of protozoa. This is from chapters, uh, chapter five, actually, that we didn't cover. And so when bacteria form spores, that's their dormant form. In protozoa, when they form, uh, when they go dormant, we call them cysts. Uh, zygospores, which are specific spores for fungus, viruses, uh, bacteria with more resistant vegetative cells, um, things that have tougher cell membranes or cell walls like Mycobacterium tuberculosis, Staphylococcus aureus, and Pseudomonas um, species. And then the lowest resistant, these would be the easiest to kill, would be most bacterial vegetative cells, things like E. coli, fungal spores other than zygospores, and fungal hypha, those are just normal fungal cells, uh, envelope viruses, these are the viruses that have membranes, yeast cells, and then protozoan trophozoites. A protozoan trophozoite is just a protozoan vegetative cell. It's just a happy growing protozoan cell. It's not the cyst form, which is dormant, but it's just the vegetative or living form of protozoa. Uh, please make sure you know the difference between protozoan cysts and protozoan trophozoites for the test. Uh, prions, we've talked about prions before in chapter six. Uh, these are proteins that propagate by transmitting a misfolded state. And here are some of the diseases that prions responsible, are responsible for. Uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, uh, scrapie, which is a non-fatal skin disease in sheep. We talked briefly about scrapie in Chapter 6. Uh, Crushville-Jacobs disease, which is a human variant form of bovine spongiform encephalopathy and then kuru, a disease that found uh, specifically if when cannibals are eating brain tissue from other humans, and then this disease is spread. Um, the non-infective form is uh, denoted by PRP uh, superscript C, and this means that it's a, it's a protein that has a potential of being prionic, but it's not prionic yet uh, because it hasn't interacted with a prion protein. And then SC, which stands for scrapie, denotes the infective form of a prion.
and we saw this slide before. This is just how prions propagate. Um, Non-prionic cells will interact with prionic cells that will recruit the prions. Some of this can happen spontaneously, and then with the accumulation of prionic cells, then you get prionic disease. Here's Crutchfield-Jacobs disease under a microscope. This is normal tissue. These are brain tissues, and you can see the different nuclei here. And then you start to see that it's spongiform. You start to see little holes forming where the um, cell material is being killed and is stretching away from the rest of the cells. And so you get these little holes. Uh, the brain looks like Swiss cheese. Okay, and I'm not going to show you that video. That's a disturbing video of a mad cow. Okay. Um, now, going back to uh, disinfection and sterilization, we have to talk about the different sterilization agents in the nomenclature. So if something has side in it, that means that it kills specifically. So a bacterial cytal will kill bacteria. Something static means that it stays the same, or it just prevents growth of the entity, but it doesn't kill the entity itself. So bacteria static means that the bacteria won't grow, but they're not necessarily dying either. Bacteria side kills all bacteria, but the endospore stage, and in order to kill spores, then you have to get a sporicide. So a sporicide will kill specifically bacterial spores. Uh, static, bacteria static, presents, prevents growth of bacteria on tissues or an object in the environment. And microbial static prevents growth of a broad variety of microbes, but it does not kill all microbes. And a lot of times you'll use something that's microbial static to um, treat human tissues or to protect human tissues because something that's microbial static is not as harsh and won't have harmful side effects that something microbicidal might have. So you want to gauge when you're dealing with something that kills microbes or uh, prevents growth of microbes, you want to make sure that you reduce toxicity to humans. In terms of microbial death, uh, sterilization, uh, it generally, if you take something and you put it in a steam autoclave, um, at a temperature of 121 degrees Celsius generally takes anywhere between 12 and 15 minutes to completely sterilize uh, the entity and get rid of all cells. If you have a low bacterial load, it's going to take less time. If you have a high bacterial load, it's going to take more time. And then if you have spores, they're more difficult to kill. So it's going to take longer time, and vegetative cells are easier to, to kill, so it's going to take less time. And then if we have different agents, say if we have a culture of cells uh, at 10 to the 9th cells, and we add a microbicidal agent, then those cells will start to die off. Oh, I lost my arrow. Okay, there you are. Okay, so those cells will die off, but if it's microbistatic, then it won't kill the cells. It will just prevent any further growth. <clears throat> um, some of these agents will uh, attack the cell wall. They can block cell wall synthesis. They can digest the cell wall uh, or break down the cell wall surface. Some will disrupt the cell membrane and surfactants, uh, including detergents, will open up the tight interface of the cell membrane and they allow toxic chemicals to leak directly into the cells that kills the cells directly. Some will inhibit protein synthesis and nucleic acid synthesis. So gamma, ultraviolet, x-rays um, all result in permanent inactivation of DNA. And then an antibiotic called chloramphenicol will bind the ribosomes. And when the ribosomes are bound, they can no longer translocate along messenger RNA. And that stops peptide bonds from forming. Uh, some um, antimicrobials will block protein function. They denature proteins. And denaturation, this happens specifically during heat treatment. The protein unfolds and it's no longer active. 
Uh, sometimes denaturation involves the addition of metal ions, and the metal ions will block the protein active sites, and they prevent the substrate from binding. So these print proteins are rendered inactive. So we start out with the native state of an enzyme. And here is its substrate or several substrates in the enzyme. If we take heat or pH change, that will completely denature the enzyme and cause it to unravel. Uh, or it may cause a different shape or different conformation, which abolishes the active site. So the active site can no longer su uh, accept substrate. Or we can add heavy metals, which will specifically bind the active site and block the active site binding. In terms of physical control, this is without the use of specific chemicals. The most effective form of physical control outside of incineration is moist heat. Moist heat um, causes spores to soften up, so spores can be sterilized. Without moist heat, dry heat is ineffective in sterilizing spores. So, But dry heat can be used to sterilize vegetative cells. Uh, Radiation is very effective. However, there are toxicity side effects to humans. Um, extreme cold. Um, when something is uh, uh, frozen or frozen dried, that will retard cell growth, but it does not kill the organism. So when the organisms are thawed back out, then you still have a chance of contamination. Uh, desiccation, which is drying. Uh, can sterilize, but many organisms, especially bacteria, can be rehydrated. Uh, filtration, to use a very, very small uh, pore size filter to block uh, microbial growth. Okay, and if we look at moist heat, it turns out that dry heat requires much longer time and higher temperatures over longer time durations to achieve sterilization. However, when we have steam under pressure at uh, temperatures higher than 100 degrees Celsius, um, then if we um, autoclave specifically at 121 degrees Celsius um, or above and 15 pounds per square inch pressure, this is generally the best choice for sterilization. You could go higher, however, with higher pressure, then this uh, can compromise the integrity of the samples, uh, you know, things like media that you're trying to sterilize. And so it's much more convenient just to hold the autoclave at 15 pounds per square inch and 121 degrees Celsius. Uh, Non-pressurized steam, this would be uh, holding material in boiling water um, and exposing it to free-flowing steam for 30 to 60 minutes. However, you have to repeat the exposure over three days in order to get the instruments completely sterilized. Uh, pasteurization, you hear this a lot in terms of milk and some juices. Uh, heat is applied to beverages, but it, pasteurization does not completely sterilize the fluid. It's done at a lower temperature than boiling temperature and lower incubation time. So some microorganisms will survive. And, and as you know, milk eventually spoils. Pasteurization just keeps it from spoiling quickly. Boiling water, uh, if you just want to quickly decontaminate items, you can boil water for 30 minutes and remove most organisms. Uh, just by holding things like instruments in the uh, directly in the boiling water. Dry heat, and I do need to say this unequivocally, incineration is the best of all heat treatments. If you have something that can withstand burning, then hold it in a Bunsen burner, and that is the most effective. It is more effective than steam sterilization, but steam sterilization is much more convenient for things like growth media, which you can't burn, uh, and other microbial formulations. So, but the best method of sterilization is hands down incineration. You can also use a hot air oven, which is not as good as a steam autoclave, uh, requires a longer period of time, 150 to 180 degrees Celsius, 
over two to four hours, and that will not kill spores. Cold, um, cold doesn't kill the microbes, it just merely retards the activities of most microbes. And these are temperatures from negative 70 to negative 135 degrees Celsius. And you can use these to preserve, actually freeze and preserve to thaw out bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Uh, you can air dry more delicate pathogens, things like um, uh, protozoa, trophozoites. And then you can freeze dry. And this is a good way of preserving organisms for many years. The freeze dried organisms are not dead. They just need to be rehydrated. And once they're rehydrated, uh, then they'll be living active cultures. Radiation. Uh, this is radiation above the uh, frequency of light and smaller wavelengths in light. And so these are energies emitted from atomic activities um, that are dispersed at high velocity through matter and space. And this would be gamma rays, x-rays, and ultraviolet radiation. Um, ionizing radiation includes only gamma rays and x-rays. And this is when the radiation frequency is so high and the wavelength is so low, it actually interacts with individual electrons in an atom. Uh, when or atoms are ejected from orbitals, this causes DNA to mutate, and it also causes proteins to be damaged. Uh, and this is used specifically in food uh, to kill microbes as well as insects and worms. Uh, can be used for sterilization of medical equipment. And uh, during the anthrax attacks, which we talked about in class, uh, this was used and is still used in Washington, D.C., in Congress to sterilize mail uh, just to prevent uh, any further anthrax attacks. Those attacks were insidious and people from congressional offices died because of them. And so now all mail is sterilized through ionizing radiation. <clears throat> Non-ionizing radiation would be UV light. Uh, this does cause DNA damage to cells. It causes thymine to cross-link. Um, it is not ionizing. It, it is not as penetrating. and usually is aimed towards disinfecting a surface. Uh, some sterile flow hoods have UV lights in them, and before you work in a sterile flow hood, you turn on the UV light for 20 minutes or more, and that disinfects the surface of the hood. Uh, these are also used in food and drug applications where disinfection is important. So you see that radiation damage, all sorts of different types of damage can occur uh, due to ionizing and non-ionizing radiation, including uh, breaks between hydrogen bonds and breaks between double strands. Here we have a thymine crosslink. Okay. And this causes a kink in the DNA. You can have other crosslinks that are unnatural, okay? Crosslinks that go diagonal that are not um, uh, hydrogen bonds across the rungs of the DNA ladder. And you can have uh, single strand breaks as well. Filtration is used to filter out microbes from liquids and gases and is a um, option that uses a, a filter with pore diameters that are usually fine. Um, the standard is about 0.5 microns, and that's sufficient for filtering out bacteria, but it will not filter out viruses. To filter out viruses, you need a much finer pore diameter, um, but 0.5 is usually the standard for things like filtering liquids. Um, and so if you want to decontaminate milk or beer without losing filter or flavor, then that's the option that's used. You may have heard the term cold filtered beer. Um, most beer is pasteurized, but if beer is cold filtered, then it has a different taste. You, lose, you don't lose the flavor by cold filtering beer, but you do lose the microbes. And then air filtration. Uh, most surgical suites are equipped with high-efficiency particulate air or HEPA filters uh, in sterile rooms and in hospitals. Um, and these will filter out and sterilize incoming building air to make sure that things like uh, surgical suites are maintained sterile.
And here somebody suited up. Here, this individual is suited up not to protect them, uh, but pr to protect the environment against them. So um, all surfaces, skin surfaces, have been previously disinfected, and then this person is gowned up. Okay. Chemical control of organisms. There's a, many, many chemicals that are used um, to inhibit growth of bacteria and other microbes. Uh, many are dissolved in water and some are dissolved in alcohol. They're in water, they're aqueous, and if they're in alcohol or alcohol water mixtures, they're called tinctures. And there are tons of products to limit microbes in society, over um, 10,000 products that exert chemical control over microbes. This creates selection pressure and it does create super microbes that can withstand disinfection and sterilization. So widespread overuse of these compounds could favor, um, be through selection pressure, uh, the survival and growth of resistant strains of bacteria. The more we bombard bacteria with these compounds, the more bacteria have the opportunity to adapt and naturally select in order to overcome the chemicals. Okay. So the different factors we use in uh, influencing germicidal activity of chemicals. First of all, what's the concentration of the germicide? Second, how long is it being exposed for? Third, the nature of the material being treated. Is it a, a material that is sensitive like human skin or is it something tough like stainless steel? And then third, the degree of contamination. How, how much bacteria are we actually killing? So there are different chemical groups of germicides. Uh, one of the most prevalent is halogen antimicrobials. This would be fluorine, bromine, chlorine, and iodine. Uh, they are microbicidal and are sporicidal at higher concentrations. And the main one is chlorine. We use chlorine all the time as a disinfectant. It can be used as an alternative in the laboratory as, uh, from back down, but it's more toxic to humans. Uh, phenol derivatives, um, phenol, cresyl, chlorinated uh, phenols, and bisphenols. These were derived from petroleum, uh, specifically from coal tar, and were the first uh, disinfectants, disinfectants used by Joseph Lister, uh, used in a surgical suite. Um, we have a phenol derivative called carbofusion that we use in uh, the laboratory for staining. An alternative use of carbofusion, fusion, which is a phenol, is a disinfectant. Then chlorhexidine, which is sort of this pink liquid, is used for hand scrubbing in uh, hospitals, preparing skin sites for surgery and injections, and whole body washing prior to surgery. Uh, it's used in multiple applications. Uh, it's also a preservative for eye solutions. Okay. Here's a typical surgical suite at the time of Joseph Lister. Noticing, notice they're not gowned up. We haven't gone very far at this point. They were not wearing masks, so they're contaminating the patient. But there was an anesthesiologist here, over here, who had um, a canister of phenol gas and he was actually causing the gas to disperse, to disperse over the surgical site. Here's chlor chlorhexidine hand wash, it's just a pink liquid. Okay. Um, also alcohol, uh, namely 70% ethanol, is great for de-germing applications. Um, isopropyl alcohol is also used. Um, isopropyl alcohol is used because it's more deserming, but it can also be more toxic to the nervous system. And it, unlike ethyl alcohol, isopropyl alcohol cannot be consumed as a beverage, it's poison. Hydrogen peroxide, which forms lots of oxygen radicals that are toxic to cells, is used primarily as a topical uh, deserming application uh, and for wound cleansing, specifically bed sores. Uh, you can also use it as a mouthwash uh, for um, oral wounds. 
um, and then used in a variety of other applications. Detergents um, act as surfactants, and they're usually mixed with something else that's toxic, toxic cells like chlorhexidine or iodine. And as the cell membrane is rinsed away and pores are formed in the cell membrane, then the chlorhexidine and iodine can leak into the cell and kill its contents. Here's a bed sore. Uh, these bed sores are pressure wounds. They're caused by lack of circulation in specific areas to people who are convalescent, who don't have a whole lot of mobility. Um, here's hydrogen peroxide on a wound. Um, our skin cells beneath the surface contain an enzyme called catalase, and it will convert hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water, and that's why it bubbles up. Okay, and here's a bed sore that's being packed with cloths that are um, uh, soaked in hydrogen peroxide. You pack the bed sore in, in these cloths that, have, that are uh, completely dripping with hydrogen peroxide, and that keeps the bed sore from getting infected. Uh, heavy metal compounds, this is predominantly mercury and silver. Uh, are very toxic to bacteria at very low concentrations. Uh, they bind the active sites of proteins and inactivate proteins, shutting down metabolism. Um, but uh, these metals can be very toxic to humans, uh, including specifically mercury. And in my opinion, I think these are too risky to use in these applications. I've just seen too many um, uh, side effects to humans, including neurological difficulties, especially when using uh, mercury-containing compounds. Aldehydes would include glutaraldehyde or formaldehyde, which make preservatives. Um, ethylene oxide gas uh, will um, denature DNA and protein, and then some dyes, acids, and bases. Okay, and that concludes this particular chapter. It was a really, really short chapter on microbial control. And this will conclude the material that is going to be on exam one. Um, and let me see where I am in terms of lecture time. So at this point, I will conclude the first video lecture, and then I'll resume the next video lecture with chapter 12.